The Ruth Page School of Dance at the Ruth Page Center for the Arts provides the highest level of training to young dancers and professionals. Register now for the school's Summer Dance Workshop, a two-week program for beginning dancers ages 7 to 14, with no audition required. For more information, visit ruthpage.org. Hey podcast listeners, are you looking for other ways to keep up with the latest in dance news? Check out Dance Media's suite of free newsletters. Go to dancemagazine.com slash subscribe to sign up today. Dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. And I'm Amy Brandt. We are editors at Dance Media, and in this episode, we will start out with our usual dance headline rundown, which, as we're recording just after the school shooting in Texas, unbelievably includes news about another gun tragedy in the ballet world. Then we will discuss the challenges and joys of dancing and performing during pregnancy, as inspired by Kanita R. Miller's recent performances in the revival of For Colored Girls on Broadway. And finally, we'll talk about how truly open communication can be cultivated inside dance organizations and how an effective communication strategy can help root out racial bias. Before we get into all of that, a shout out for our upcoming episode of the Dance Edit Extra, our exclusive audio interview series, which is coming out this Saturday on Apple Podcasts. This time, we've got the delightful Kylie Kwan, who talks about discovering her voice as a choreographer since leaving Ballet X in 2020, her upcoming stint as artist-in-residence at the Vail International Dance Festival, and how her Chamorro Filipino identity ends up shaping pretty much all of her work. It's a really great conversation, so I hope you can give it a listen. Again, it'll be out this Saturday, May 28th, on Apple Podcasts. You can search for The Dance Edit Extra there. All right, now it's time for our dance headline rundown, starting with the terrible news out of Arizona. 25-year-old Colleen Hoops, a dancer with Ballet Arizona, was shot and killed by her husband in the early morning hours of May 20th. According to local news reports, he claims she startled him in the middle of the night. She was later pronounced dead at the hospital. Her husband, Christopher Hoops, was arrested and charged with second-degree murder and unlawful discharge of a weapon. Colleen was from Rochester, New York, where she trained at the Draper Center for Dance Education and danced for Rochester City Ballet before joining Ballet Arizona in 2017. The company released a statement saying, um, we are heartbroken to learn of the passing of company dancer Colleen Hoops. Colleen was an integral part of the Ballet Arizona family and will be missed deeply. She was passionate and dedicated to her art form and the bright light to us all. Our hearts go out to her loved ones. Her parents hoped to start a scholarship in her name, according to uh, local news reports. So it's just such terrible news. It's so tragic. Um, It seems like we're also not quite clear yet on what exactly happened. Um, We have a news story linked for you in the show notes with more details. Major news from TikTok this week. The app has announced that it's introducing its first ever creator crediting tools, which will allow users to easily tag and credit the creators who may have inspired their videos um, using a new button in the video category. Some users had started doing this in a more sort of homespun way for dance videos in particular, adding that DC or dance credit tag when dancing others choreography. But now it's much easier to credit people in a way that might especially help the BIPOC community members of which often do not get credit for starting popular trends on the app. And TikTok says it will also be adding more prompts to credit throughout the posting process soon. On Friday, the Broadway League said that theatergoers will be required to continue wearing masks until the end of June. The news comes as New York City is experiencing an influx of COVID cases. That said, Broadway is seemingly going strong. The president of the Broadway League told the New York Daily News that a quarter million people have been attending shows weekly this spring. So keep those masks on, I guess. Yeah. And if Patti LuPone has to yell at people to get them to keep their masks on the theater, so be it. Bless her. (laughs) Uh, More Broadway news. This week, members of multiple Broadway productions were released from non-disclosure agreements that had previously prohibited them from speaking about workplace misconduct related to producer Scott Rudin. 
The release was secured by Actors' Equity. It, of course, comes after Rudin has faced numerous allegations of misconduct and abuse. And there's actually some related news here that has even wider reaching implications. The Broadway League has also agreed to stop using non disclosure language in contracts outside of protecting intellectual property or financial information. That means that Broadway workers will have greater freedom to speak out about workplace harassment and discrimination. Big step forward. Finally, gosh. Investigative journalists from Important Stories and the German publication Der Spiegel have reported that Igor Zelensky, the former director of Bavarian State Ballet in Munich, has allegedly been in a serious romantic relationship with Vladimir Putin's daughter, Katerina Tikhonova, and that they allegedly share a child together. Zelensky, who is married to former dancer Jana Serebrikova, recently stepped down from his position in Munich, citing private family circumstances that required his full attention. Very interesting news. I mean, when this news first broke, it was like, is this the plot to a spy novel? It felt so surreal. Like, I I remember when Zelensky first left that position of the Bavarian State Ballet, there was some speculation about whether it had to do with his connections to Russia. And it seems like that is, in fact, the case. But this is not the kind of connection I think most of us were imagining. Um, Yeah. We've got links to more articles about that in the show notes. A big promotion happened at New York City Ballet this week. Chan Wai Chan, who recently joined the company as a soloist after dancing with Houston Ballet, has been made a principal dancer. He's the company's first Chinese principal and only the fourth Asian dancer to ever hold that rank at City Ballet. And it could not be more deserved. He's been dancing so beautifully. I have been rooting for him all season. I just love watching him dance. The Royal Ballet has two new principal dancers as well. Artistic director Kevin O'Hare announced that he has promoted William Bracewell and Reese Clark to the company's top rank to take effect at the start of the 2022-23 season. So congratulations to both of them. Yes, and congratulations are also in order for Ariana DeBose. Actually, that's a phrase we've been saying a lot recently. Congrats are in order for triple threat Ariana DeBose. She's been named one of Time Magazine's most influential people of 2022. And the list also includes a few other folks with dance and theater connections, including Channing Tatum, Michael R. Jackson, and Zendaya. Philodenko has just received a -a three-and-a-half-year grant from the Mellon Foundation worth $850,000. The grant will go towards new programming, staff expansion, cataloging and preservation of archives, and an upgrade towards its Philadelphia headquarters and residential apartments. What a great vote of confidence by the Mellon Foundation to Philodenko. So this is really great news. Yeah, yeah. And a blessedly positive note on which to end our official headline rundown. But um, before we move on to discussion segments, I also wanted to direct you to the Dance Media Events Calendar, which has listings for all kinds of newsworthy performances and events, including a lot of stuff we don't have time to get to on the podcast. So to make sure you're not missing out on any upcoming shows or auditions or to add your own events to the calendar, please head to dancemediacalendar.com. All right. So in our first discussion segment today, we'd like to talk about a recent Dance Magazine article profiling Kanita R. Miller, the extraordinary performer who just finished a run as the Lady in Red in the revival of For Colored Girls on Broadway. And the reason she just finished the run is because she is about to reach her due date. She had been performing in the show, which features director Camille Brown's athletic, rigorous choreography while pregnant. Um, Miller's work in For Colored Girls was fantastic. She earned a Tony nomination for it. But it was also an anomaly in theater and in dance as well, where pregnant bodies are often not seen, let alone celebrated on stage. So hopefully it's indicative of greater openness on the part of directors and choreographers to working with and finding inspiration in pregnant artists. Yeah, the article says that um, this is Kanita's first pregnancy, something she had hoped for for many years and had all but given up on conceiving a child. So when she found out she was pregnant during a workshop of this show, uh, you know, that's kind of where her participation could have ended. But choreographer Camille Brown was open to working with her and taking things one step at a time and seeing what was possible. And it's really amazing to see how, you know, she was kind of allowed to continue performing and, and bring something really special, I think, to the role. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, too, is that the fact that she was visibly pregnant on stage, added so many layers of meaning to the story that her character in particular was telling, it really elevated the stakes in some Mm -hmm. ways. um, Because the 
The Lady in Red delivers a poem about a woman watching her children being killed by an ex-lover and a pregnant woman giving that speech. That is incredibly powerful. And then at the end of the monologue, all of the women in the cast kind of do a laying on of hands on Miller to empower her. That reads really differently, too, with a Mm -hmm. pregnant body. Um, I think all of that is just evidence of the like rich creative possibilities that are inherent in pregnancy in this time of transformation. And Mm -hmm. I don't mean to say that pregnant bodies like exist to be used for their creative potential, of course not. But if a pregnant performer is open to the idea of making art that incorporates her changing body, there's so much Mm -hmm. to be explored. Yeah. And I know, I think a lot of dancers are pretty nervous when approaching leadership to tell them that they're mm-hmm. that they're pregnant. I mean, I know a lot of my friends have gotten pretty nervous about having that conversation. There's a fear you'll be shelved or that you're letting the company down because you're not available or you won't be available um, or that you'll be f- more focused on your family and not on your career and whatnot. And, um, you know, and I honestly, I say that for dancers, but I think it's true for for a lot of professions, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's inter- it's really nice to see this story, and it says a lot about Camille A. Brown, honestly. Um, it does, right? Yeah. I have a friend of mine who um, who was pregnant, and uh, a choreographer was working with the company, and had worked with her previously, um, and she had kind of really inspired him, and he created this very special solo for her, and she was very pregnant. I mean, I think beyond six months or so. And, uh, you you know, just kind of this moment in the middle of the ballet where she came out and it was a very like kind of special one of a kind experience, I think very rewarding for the audience to watch as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Certainly rewarding for her as an artist. Yeah. And I think that kind of story, it's, it's pushing back against, yeah, that old fashioned idea that women should basically disappear once they become visibly pregnant, should like remove themselves from public life and be lying in bed and especially not be exerting themselves mm-hmm. physically. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's iron- well, ironic is the wrong word, but it's strange too that that rule has been especially stringently enforced for performers and among performers, especially dancers. Mm-hmm. Like if there's any kind of visible bump, usually people are saying you shouldn't be on stage. But it's also especially ridiculous for dancers when like your body is your life being told Mm -hmm. to essentially forget about that part of yourself or give it over entirely to this biological process. That seems bananas. Um, It does seem like we're making progress on that front slowly to the point where now, like I keep thinking about that video of Ashley Bowder doing Fuetes at Mm -hmm. eight or nine months pregnant. And most (laughs) people were were cheering her during that. But, But there were still some folks commenting that oh she's endangering her baby or like otherwise reacting Mm -hmm. in a negative way to a pregnant body in a dance environment you know i think there are safety concerns that people have and that's that's normal as well and you know not every woman will be comfortable with dancing to a certain extent in their pregnancy and all of that but you know like this story says kanita was in very close contact with her doctors and kind of listening to them and to her own body throughout this whole journey so yeah and ended up saying that, in fact, dancing made her feel so much better physically mm-hmm. during her pregnancy. It helped her listen to her body in a different kind of way, um, which I think echoes things we've heard from other dancer moms as well. Um, anyway, congratulations to Kanita Miller on her beautiful work in this yeah. show and also on becoming a mother. Yeah. We have the link to the Dance Magazine profile in the show notes. Last up this week, we actually have another dance magazine story we'd like to get into. This one is about open door communication policies inside dance companies, um, which have become a new sort of gold standard, like saying that your company has an open door policy signals a desire to foster trust among all the different members of your organization and a certain willingness to confront institutional problems and particularly racial bias. But actually constructing a communication policy that lives up to those ideals is complicated. And this dance magazine piece talks to several dance world experts about why it's so challenging and how to overcome those challenges. With I think one of the biggest takeaways being dance companies need outside help here. Yeah, particularly on the issue of uh, rooting out racial bias. Mm -hmm. I think someone's quoted as saying being a good person is not enough. Mm -hmm. It's important to have like a diversity, equity and inclusion specialist take a look at things from the outside 
especially for some of these larger companies that were founded on the white paradigm. You know, it's it's so institutionalized, it's so ingrained that it helps to have someone from the outside help them work through this and and develop new communication methods. Um, not only that, but like audits as well, like regular audits. Mm-hmm. Um, since we're emphasizing the importance of expert help, I just wanted to shout out the three fantastic experts featured in this story itself. I mean, you've got Teresa Ruth Howard, you've got Erica Lynette Edwards from Cultivating Better Tomorrows. There's Tamia Santana from Ballet Hispanico. I mean, that is such an all-star group. Um, But yeah, I thought it was especially interesting when Edwards was talking about how it's important to develop a shared language for your organization so that everybody's using the same terms and everyone knows what those terms mean. Like she gives Mm -hmm. the example of when we talk about diversity in dance, quote unquote, what does that mean? Is it coded language for race? It usually is. Mm -hmm. Um, But diversity can include many identities beyond race or ethnicity or gender. So let's specify what we actually mean when we're talking about diversity. And um, there was also the idea that a good communication strategy is usually designed with the input of everybody at the organization so that everyone can work together to hold each other accountable as as Howard says. Because mm-hmm. um, when the whole community helps develop policies together, that sort of flattens hierarchies. So nobody's afraid to make their voice heard, whether they're an apprentice or an executive director. And then on sort of the, the flip side of that, it's also important to have a way to anonymously report incidents of racial bias or microaggression or other forms of inappropriate conduct so that anyone can have the freedom to voice their concerns openly without having to fear repercussions. Yeah, that is really important. Yeah, she does stress the importance of having just like a variety of voices being across the organization and in different positions, being able to have a voice at the table and and communicate freely. And if, you know, sometimes that's easier to do anonymously. It's certainly not the way, certainly in my experience, the communication hierarchy, you know, ladder was was structured. (laughs) It was very much top down, but it's important to have more voices at the table feeling comfortable because if you if you're you can say you have an open door policy but if you you're not comfortable approaching your boss or whoever in your organization with an issue there's something that's not tracking in that open door policy Mm -hmm. you know right yeah yeah and fixing that i mean going back to the idea of being a good person with good intentions versus being a person who's actually helping to make meaningful change in a company's culture, a lot of that has to do with how we communicate and how we are allowed to communicate. Mm-hmm. And how we respond. Yeah. You know, how you can say, we're, you know, open door. And then if you can bring in a complaint, and if you're met with instant defensiveness, you know, the door shuts <laughs> real fast. Shuts immediately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a great story with advice that, as Amy said, is relevant to pretty much any workplace, not just dance workplaces. So we have the link for you in the show notes. I hope you can check it out. All right. That's it for us this week. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Bye, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Amy Brandt, Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. 